And you sure, yeah. seem that you have a much larger slide deck. I suggest that at some point you record for those slides and make that available. I will do that, Ashin. I have yeah, a, I, I anyway, actually, I have, hmm. anyway, this will be uh, only a subset of that. So. Right. I had planned to do that last night, but couldn't get the time, but I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. OK, anyway, so I mean, just quickly, so there are, so basically, you have some control agents, right? You have activation functions, you have back propagation. And optimization, as you can see, forms a very, very important uh, you know, backbone of training neural networks, right? I mean, for convex cases and for non-convex cases as well. And we have some error bounds for both convex and non-convex problems, which we showed last year, that um, even for mean absolute error, there are um, you know, error bounds. I mean, we can achieve an error bound and I'm at least a lower bound of error. And uh, is basically, there is also an upper bound of the number of iterations to converge. Anyway, now optimization problems are hard, right? I mean, there are re reinforcement learning kind of problems and other kind of problems as well. So gener generally, there are two types of optimization methods. One is a line search, and the other one is a trust region based methods. Now for line search methods in every iteration, so what we do is we find a direction towards the maximum descent in the optimization function and take a step in that direction with step length as the hyperparameter, right? Okay. So, however, I mean, in, in a problem which is typically, you know, visualized in this manner, I mean, the we can also think of iterative methods, which are called trust region based methods that define a region around the any given point, okay? And in which the quadratic approximation of the objective function is valid. And then they search the region for minimizing that approximation. Okay. And that and that's the way for them to decide the next point in the iterative scheme. Okay. So one of the important benefits of such methods is that it is second order in nature, unlike many search methods, which are actually first order approximation. And, and the method that we are proposing today, I'm, I'm going to talk about today, is also actually a line search method with the first order approximation, right? So what happens is it's, it's it's based on the effective, the trust region policies are based on the effectiveness of the quadratic approximation. So the, if the approximation is excellent, then the search space is automatically increased or decreased, right? However, in what in a gradient descent or a stochastic gradient descent, which are point-wise line search methods, finding the optimal step size is always difficult, especially when the objective function you know is either non-quadratic or highly non-linear. All right. So so the optimization is a hard problem. It's a really hard problem, right? And there are several aspects. One is the learning rate. The other one is the overparameterization, so on and so forth. Which robust, which loss function are you going to choose? Is it really you know robust and so on and so forth? Okay. So by landscape optimization, I'm referring to the trust region policy kind of methods. Okay. Um, so as you can see in the slide itself, wherever relevant, I have kept the um, you know relevant papers that we have. So there is also this debate: is that should we be really worried about the local minima or try to find the global minima? Right? Okay. I mean, it's important to escape the subtle points like the Pringles cheap over here, right? But the obsession to find the global minima it could sometimes lead us. In fact, there is a paper which shows that if you try to do that, right, then the network size explodes and the time to reach the global minima is also exponential. So people really do not care about global minima much, okay, when you are learning for the optimization problem. Um, okay, now I'm going to, so these are some of the caveats. I mean, this is, I mean, these are one or a couple of slides which I always keep when we talk about deep learning over big data, right? Um, many a times leading to false meaningless inferences is because that the loss function is chosen is not appropriately robust enough, okay? All right, and there are some costs, and then this is a really hard optimization problem. Um, what really happens here is that uh, when we deal with problems in astronomy, particularly with objects from several catalogs, right? In this case, the stars and quasars, right? And when we want to make now, what people are trying to do is that they try to merge all the catalogs. So your feature space is continuously changing. So what is a good optimization or a classification paradigm for one particular catalog does not really hold good, right? Anyway, we, we solved that problem uh, some time ago, but it's nonetheless, it's just an example of a very hard optimization problem, which is to detect the boundaries between stars and quasars. 
and, and this is i mean one of the things that i mean while training a neural network it the laptop got so heated up that i mean a collaborator of mine had to put it in his refrigerator right okay anyway so the idea is optimize 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 but how you must have also noticed the way that this slide deck is prepared is that i have also tried wherever i could uh, is to incorporate the basic reading material that uh, starter for starters right i mean for beginners as well so i mean most of you do not need these gans but nonetheless and then there are some benchmarking obsessions i'm going to talk about it uh, later right i mean it's just a list it over here um and i'm i'm not i'm going to skip this slide as well right so the so the question is whether it's a local minima global minima do we escape saddle points the answer is yes right okay um so wherever point wise approximation works right in convex non convex you know sort of approximately convex landscapes right so there is this thing that we want to talk about which is adaswarm okay and in fact this is the paper that i was talking about by lekun and others that in a multi layer neural network i mean if you try to find the global minima as the network size increases the time to find the local global minima actually becomes exponential right so the idea is if there is a loss function that is difficult to you know compute right is there a way to approximate it okay using something else when I mean, using some other tools that we have right and that is what ada swarm talks about okay all right so it's a combination of adam and particle sort all right and this is the equivalence relation that we typically use in neural network training okay where we can see that the error gradient which is what you are supposed to compute because you have to eventually update the weights right so the error gradient can be approximately represented by this okay all right where this delta y delta net is nothing but the derivative of the activation function so all we require for this kind of approximation to work is that the activation function that you choose needs to be differentiable that's all okay now why so the, so the question is why do i need to approximate the gradient error gradient the answer lies in several physical system problems i mean a good example being a schrodinger equation where your loss function is not a typical loss function it's not a mean square error it's not a cross entropy it's not mean absolute error it's not it's not thing it's nothing that you have seen so far so what exactly is the loss the loss is basically the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side so it's like almost impossible to compute imagine some other very hard partial differential equations yeah the kind of equations that we see in ocean waves right i mean those are irregular loss types all right so i mean sometimes you can't even differentiate because they the solution itself right the left hand difference between the left hand side and the right hand side the solution itself is weakly differentiable it's not even defined on the hilbert space so so these are some of the at the same time the kind of loss functions that we typically use like mean square error binary cross entropy or even mean absolute error right where you have difficulty in computing that derivative at a particular point right so you sort of require a gradient approximation so these are some of the points at the surface which led us to you know think of a method which we could use to approximate the gradient okay all right um <clears throat> so the control dynamics is the following roughly speaking is that if you are if we are near the local minima right and near the local minima the swarm dynamics will help us converge away from the local minima it's a, it's a simple gradient dynamics okay whatever we do in gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent so that's that's the mix i must also tell you that trying to merge this swarm type methods with neural network type methods is not new but what is new is that nobody has whoever attempted some sort of genetic algorithm kind of emulation of the gradient never really attempted to approximate the error gradient itself so what they did was that they replaced the weight so they have kept a particle for every weight so imagine in over parameterized neural network when you have millions and millions of weights that many particles you have to deal with when you are handling into the swarm dynamics and that becomes really really cumbersome because the way swarms work is that there is one global best right and everybody needs to follow it 
So you need to keep the population minimum. You need to keep the population fixed and you don't want the population to go away. So this idea of G-best is like, it's like this. So I'm going to skip this, right? Um, so this is the Schrodinger solver and the loss function is really the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side, what we have been talking about, okay? So one of the many motivations for us to attempt something like this, one was the Schrodinger equation, okay? And there was another partial differential equation which we use in solving shallow water waves. I'll, I'll show it later. That's also what was another motivation, okay? But our first experimental guinea pig was this Schrodinger differential equation which we attempted to solve. Okay, and were successful to a particular ex extent for you know sort of different uh, potentials. Okay, anyway, so this is typically the loss, and there needs to be some some regularization of the boundary value problem. But this is what the swarm is, right? Now, typically, I'm going to skip all these equations and show you a very simple thing. So this is how a swarm uh, is is denoted. It's like this, you know. I mean, we have all grown up in neighborhoods, right, surrounded by neighbors, and then we had our parents, right, who constantly, at least I was constantly reprimanded of not being able to live up with Sharma Ji Ki Beti, right? I mean, so my parents used to say, okay, so you look at neighbor's daughter, she's doing so well, right? What are you doing? So there is always this benchmark, right, so available somewhere over here that I have to sort of match. Now, in order to match the benchmark, I have to first improve I mean, if I'm really bad, like like I like I am really, right? I have to first, in, you know, enhance my level. So in order to, you know, get anywhere close to Sharma Ji Kibeti, or even in the context of Dix Pilani, right? I mean, it is Srinivasan Ji Ka Beta, our own Ashwin Srinivasan, right? So it's like, so it's a, you, you know, in order to come anywhere close to Ashwin, you you got to improve your level first, correct? So typically, what happens is, I mean. I, I hope you can see this. So here I am, right? Okay. And so somewhere over here is the best performance of my neighbors. So that's the global best. So what I do is that here somewhere in this direction, I it, this is my personal best. So and in, my initial velocity is in this direction. So I need to be updating the velocity and I also need to be updating my previous position, right? So, so you can think about this in a particle space, right? Where you are constantly updating the position. Why? The reason why you are constantly updating the position is because you are never happy with your current position. That's it's a striking analogy that you can find when you update the weights in a neural network. Why do we update the weights? Because we are not happy with the initial random position of the weights. And even after a few epochs, we are not happy with the value of the weights that we get, right? So. What do we do? We update the weights. So this is sort of a metaphor that we used in our you know, derivation of the gradient equivalence. So what I do is I move in this direction and I find that I'm not good enough, even in my own standards. So I move in a direction parallel to this PI, right? So when I do that, the difference between this needs to be multiplied by a scalar because you are moving in a direction parallel to this vector, right? Then, then what I find is that, oh, I'm not good enough in comparison with Sharma Ji Ki Beti. So I need to move in the direction of Sharma Ji Ki Beti, right? So in a direction parallel to Sharma Ji Ki Beti, so then there is a difference between these two that you can easily compute, right? And multiply it by a scalar, okay? So these two scalars, so you have these two scalars which turn out to be cognitive and social intelligence factors that need to be factored in as far as a swarm is concerned, right? Okay, so, and we sort of use this idea to solve a cooperative taxi ride problem. Um, anyway, so so that is the basic condition of the swarm. But what really happens is sometimes, uh, so this typically this particle swarm kind of problems were first attempted to solve optimization problems, op, op, test optimization functions which do not admit of an analytical local minimum or a global minimum or maximum, right? So we use a population of particles and you know, one particle finds the best position to descend to and everybody else follows it, right? Now, typically what happens in with functions with many hills and valleys, right? You might get stuck. So whenever you get stuck, somebody came in and proposed a momentum term. So basically a momentum factor. There's a slight abuse of terms here that's going on, but that's not our fault, right? We did not propose the momentum particle swarm equation, but there is a momentum factor that was given to push the velocities 
whenever your your swarm gets stuck in a set in near saddle point okay now we use this idea now if you recall in stochastic gradient descent also if you think of i'm trying to draw parallels between pso and neural networks now in stochastic gradient descent also you kind of sometimes use a momentum term right for the exactly for the same reason okay so we borrow it from the neural network and we rewrite this pso equations the vanilla pso equations in the following manner that um you know um <clears throat> you, we have an exponentially average sort of a momentum right so this momentum term which is the first term on the right hand side is as a convex combination as a weighted combination of the momentum and the previous velocities so what we are doing is that we are not discarding any of the previous velocities but because this is a recursive kind of an expression what you will see in the next slide is that there is um not in the next slide i think this one right sorry what you will see is that the the velocities which are farther away from the current position are given lesser weight because the beta is chosen between 0 and 1 okay all right and in a typical swarm there is this exploration and exploitation correct okay so this exploration and exploitation are given equal importance in in the exponentially average momentum particle swarm optimization method so when we started this when we first proposed this method neural network was not in our minds at all right we just wanted to solve multi objective optimization problems but it turned out later as we kept on working was that this could be extrapolated to neural networks as well okay so this is typically uh, another example that you know i i could i could give which is basically you are there are two people in two different boats right and there is a lake and what happens they both of them are trying to catch a fish and the fish is kind of not it's sort of hiding in the in a in a very very deep ocean of the lake so the idea is in order to catch the fish what you have to do is that you keep on scouring the depth of the lake right and you do that on a cooperative fashion right and i mean i think the the visualization is instructive enough that whenever i mean you 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 and your friend are doing this and each and every time you guys are measuring the depth of the lake and shouting to each other and communicating to each other and when both of them agree that this is the <clears throat> maximum depth of the lake the search stops so that is typically the way particle swarm works right but as you can see here right or for that matter any meta heuristic algorithm there are hyperparameters and parameters to tune okay so the question at this point is that in a neural network setting where we already have a large number of parameters to handle if we bring in particle swarm dynamics aren't we complicating our life by having to handle more parameters the answer is no okay and why the answer is no lies in several several theorems that we proved okay what i can tell you because the time is short is that we kept each and every parameter under strict control and never played around with the values of any of the hyperparameters okay all right and we didn't need to um that is because of two things one is that um okay let's let's go to this i don't know why yes so what you can see is here is that there are the cognitive and the social factors c1 and c2 right so these are these are sort of hyperparameters that we really don't know in a vanilla pso there's a von neumann stability analysis which can be done to figure out what would be the optimal values of c1 and c2 okay what would be the optimal values of c1 and c2 so that the algorithm remains stable so we kind of extended the same analysis i think someone is trying to now okay okay all right so okay so someone is okay um so that's the so what was happening was so we extended that same analysis to empso and we showed that if the sum of c1 and plus c2 is kept between 0 and 2 then the algorithm remains stable and what we did was we kept c1 and c2 equal so that we give sort of an equal weightage to both exploration and exploitation phases of the swarm search right and r1 and r2 are random numbers pseudo random numbers drawn from a uniform distribution bounded between 0 and 1 that is pretty standard as far as particle swarm optimization is and we haven't really done anything about it to change it or 
we haven't really explored whether a better initialization works or not. Okay. So, all right. So what we did was, so when we first thought of applying this to neural networks, so our first thought was to apply it to some standard test function. So these are not typical test optimization functions in the sense that benchmark optimization, optimization functions are chosen, like Mishrabad or McCormick, not like, nothing like that. These are test optimization functions. Okay, so some are, we chose a few differentiable functions, we chose a few non-differentiable functions, and what we wanted to see was that whether the local minima or global minima can be efficiently found out by this method. Which method? By the method of gradient approximation. So we are not computing the gradient, we are using that gradient approximation formula, right? And using that approximation formula, we applied it on a bunch of different functions I just showed you two here, okay? And it turns out that near the minima, the approximation is pretty good. And as we move away from the minima, the approximation is not that good, as you can see here. Okay, which is fine with us, right? Because in, in neural networks, when you're trying to solve the optimization problem, you really care in the neighborhood of the local minima, right? Okay, so we did not really want PSO, the swarm dynamics to dominate everywhere. We wanted the swarm dynamics to dominate near the minima. Everywhere else is just the gradient dynamics. So once we were able to, you know, test it on differentiable and non-differentiable functions, we then thought, okay, let's now extrapolate this to differentiable and non-differentiable loss functions in neural networks. Okay, all right. And so the mind map is this. So so this particular block, this particular block actually tells us about the mind map, the, the entire process that went through. Okay, over the last one and a half years. Okay, so long story short, so the gradient dynamics and the swarm dynamics they hunt in pairs for the kind of optimization problems that are required in classification. Okay, well, people are joining in now. Let me. Okay, well, these are. Okay, all right. So this is the first theorem, um, and. Do I have the time to show this? Because I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to show one thing at least, um, which is um, because we had a lot of trouble, um, sort of um, convincing one referee, right? And uh, and and that particular guy's concern, I mean, our concern was that well, there are too many confusing notations and it doesn't make sense to me and things like that. So what we did was to basically show in a very simplistic notational sense that how the two things, particle swarm and gradient descent are coming together. Okay, so as I said earlier, that we update the particle positions because we are never happy with the present particle position. We update the weights because we are never happy with the present value of the weights, right? So there is some sort of you know, metaphorical equivalence between the particles and the weights, correct? Okay, so if I really, you know, think about this, is that if you if you think of particle swarm optimization, it's this, right? It is xt plus one, that is the updated position of the particle, right? Plus, there is this inertia term, correct? And, C1, R1, you know what C1, R1 is. There is this E best minus XT plus C2, R2, G best minus XT, right? Okay, all right. And so if you look at this, you take the difference between XT minus one and XT, and that is nothing but delta X, right? Okay. So this is the difference in the position that you really care about. And that is nothing but this guy, correct? Okay, now, now let's think about the plane vanilla gradient descent, right? And you just, as I said, as a metaphysical equivalence, I mean, I'm updating you just W and omega, just W, w and X are just the dummy variable. So you can use any one interchangeably. So, so this is how you are doing the weight updates, right? XT plus one equal to XT plus this hyperparameter, which is the learning rate, and then you have del f del x, correct? Okay, now, and from here, what I can see 
is that it's very simple. The del f del x is nothing but xt plus 1 minus xt, the whole thing divided by this. So you call this equation 1, you call this equation 2, and what you do is that you substitute equation 1 into 2. If you do that, your so this is what? What is this? This is nothing but your delta x, right? Or whichever way I'm defining this, okay? So this is nothing but 1 by nu delta x. And what do I know about delta x? I know that delta x is this guy, okay? So this is wbt plus c1r1 p best minus xt plus c2r2 g best minus xt. Okay, all right. And this whole thing over, this whole thing over this. Okay, all right. Now, there are some key things that we bring in here. It is well known that your search will terminate when your p best will be equal to g best, right? Because you, that's exactly how the swarm works. So you can replace the g best, right? Or uh, you can replace the p best with the g best. So I can do this. So I can replace the p best with the g best, right? Okay. If I do that, you can see that I have g best minus xt in both places, and that will help me in combining these two terms. So I can write this as c1 r1 plus c2 r2 g best minus xt. Okay. What else? I mean, I can for just for mathematical equivalence or just for convenience, I can just assume that this learning rate data is nothing but the inertia term, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter. Even if you don't do it, it, it nothing will change, right? But there is this another thing that we need to know is that when the swarm moves, and let's say you have something like this, and the swarm, I mean, the population of the swarm moves, the moment you have actually reached the desired minima, or the local minima point, right, the swarm will cease to move. It doesn't need to move any further, right? So what will happen is that at that point of time, the velocity will become zero, right? Okay, so that means that this goes away. Okay, so if that is the case, then what we have is that del f del x equal to c1 r1 g best minus xt by nu. And so I just, so 1 minus c1 r1 plus c2 r2 xt minus g best. Okay. And this we use later on in the Taylor series expansion, right, to update the error gradient weights. But this forms the crux of the idea. This actually helps us in finding out, figuring out how the error gradient can be approximated. And now let me take you back to, so I'm going to skip all this, right? This is a detailed derivation, okay? All right. And basically in the last three slides, whatever the content is shown in the last three slides, I've actually, you know, worked it out, right? So for both the vanilla gradient descent version and as well as the stochastic gradient descent version with momentum term, right? We have been able to establish the equivalences, right? And we have been also able to extend this to non-differentiable cases. We just have to do a smoothening around the point of uh, dif non-differentiability by using a shift parameter, okay? So that's, there is another theorem anyway. And this is typically a case of a part, you know, another sort of a extremely hard differential equation to solve where you do not have a sense of these standard loss functions. So where you need to approximate the gradient. Okay. Anyway, so the idea is this, the neural update rule via at a swarm is this, this delta E delta Y, which is exactly what we approximated by using the parameters of the swarm times the derivative of the activation function and the data. Okay. And this loss could be your mean square error. It could be binary cross entropy or cross entropy. It could be mean absolute error. It could be check loss. It could be anything in principle, right? Okay. And that gives us a handle on different kinds of loss functions, okay? And so before actually attempting on benchmark data sets, what we did is we created a small data set, a simulated data set with three classes, right? And we ran this, okay? And you can see that after a certain number of epochs, 
the error gradient approximation is, is working pretty well, right? We have the gradient descent with the gradient calculation, actually calculated gradient, and the gradient descent with this particular formula that we have used, okay? All right, we gained some confidence, and basically this is the code snippet where we actually call a bunch of other codes, and the, you can go to this uh, GitHub repository to find out more about the code. Okay, I must admit that the code is not very clean at this point of time, but you get the sense anyway. Okay, all right. So, I mean, there are lots of other intuitions and inspirations that we have, but I am going to just skip and give you the big picture. So what specifically Ada Swarm is, it's, it's a theoretical equivalence to error gradient computation in neural nets. So this helps us, when you do this, this actually helps us to avoid the exploding number of particles in the swarm, okay, by using the other method. So we really don't need to do that. And in, for, in fact, for all our experiments, we kept the swarm population constant fixed at 50, okay? As I already so told you, the other hyperparameters, R1 and R2, we can't do anything, right? Unless we come up with a better initialization. C1 and C2, C2, we proved the theorem to figure out a bound for setting C1 and C2, right? So the, what ADAS1 does is that the particle swarm dynamics is integrated with the backpropagation dynamics of deep neural networks. And this works on shallow as well as, you know, deep neural networks narrow or hidden, narrow or wide neural networks as well, okay? And of course, I mean, in order to show anything that works, you have to, you know, benchmark your uh, stuff. So we benchmarked it against all available state-of-the-art optimizers, which is starting with gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, Adam, Adagrad, MSGrad, Adadelta, DeepGrad. DeepGrad is actually relatively recent. I mean, it's a 2021 paper. And I, I think one of the authors of Deep, Deep Grad is joining Bates Hyderabad campus, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And so it all started with testing this stuff on a one dimensional non analytical optimization problems. And then it snowballed into optimizing neural networks. Right. Okay. And the idea is we were able to show so far and we tested up to Schrodinger that. You give us any function, differentiable or not, we, we are able to approximate it um, by using the parameters of EMPSO. Not empirically, but theoretically, by using that gradient equivalence. I must also mention that when I say non-differentiable, what I mean is the function is differentiable with finitely many singularities. If a function is not differentiable anywhere, then this does not work. Okay. There are details about performance benchmarking that I would have liked to talk, but I just would tell you that we knew that the idea is sort of hard to digest. So we actually went ahead and tested it on any and every publicly benchmarked data set that we could find, UCI, Kegel, and everywhere. So we ended up testing it on 20 different data sets, out of which 15 are non-computer vision data, right? Uh, two class, three class, four class, and five are computer vision data, right? Because if you don't do computer vision, your paper doesn't get through, right? So all of that. Well, there are limitations because this is still line search. And as I mentioned, the approximation is not nearly as good away from the minima, right? It's first order method. So there are some subtleties and there are ways to improve this by integrating with the Hamiltonian uh, Markov, Markov chain, which we are thinking right now, which is how to make this first order method to a second order method, right? Okay. But I think, uh, and that's, that's basically what I want to do uh, in future. Right. Okay. Uh, so this is adventures from the of the dancing men from Sherlock Holmes. So I mean, other than dancing around, I mean, we, we just need to figure out a way to improve the order of approximation <clears throat> as well, so that we can use it in reinforcement learning kind of problems. Okay. So now there are a bunch of slides which I'm going to skip uh, because, as I said, it was a slide deck, and I there are some classic papers that I have listed out in the very end some of the classics are in from the small data button recognition non deep learning papers and these are some of my favorites in deep learning um and i would not want to finish my talk without acknowledging the two data scientists that india had produced the greatest data scientist india had produced professor malarabis and professor kosambi and um, 
April is Mathematics and Statistics Awareness Month, and I have been thinking a lot about Maria Mirza Khani, whom we lost at a very early age, right? Um, and this is what I think. I mean, I mean, the Russians and the Jews are actually driving the theory of modern machine learning and deep learning as well. I mean, that's what that's the sense that I that I get by you know skimming through a bunch of uh, literature. Okay. And these are my comrades in this struggle so far. I mean, I am enriched by their hard work and the kind of value that they bring in um, over several projects that we have been thinking and we have been doing on deep learning, classification, regression, and other things. Right. So the next stop would be to make Adasorn more robust to you know level noise, more robust to second order approximations, more robust to landscape type of optimization problems. Right, we're using some of the ideas that are already present in the literature. Okay, and um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I had to rush through, yeah. but I think if there are questions, I think I would suggest that you make a, a more, more leisurely uh, slide deck with, with voiceover. Uh, and put that on the. Uh, uh, come, come again, Ashwin. Come again. I said that I would suggest you uh, make a more leisurely slide deck with a voiceover, and uh, and put that on the publicly available yeah, yeah, we'll do that. site so that uh, mm -hmm. rather than the recording, because I think the recording mm -hmm. is far too rushed. But yes, I, yes. are there any uh, anybody? Is there anybody who has any sort of? In fact, the paper that got through that was accepted just two days back. Um, I think I have uploaded the paper and the supplementary file along with the presentation to the Google Drive already. So those of you who have access to the drive, you can easily uh, you know read the paper because there is a lot that I couldn't say. Um, there is a lot I wanted to say that are in the paper. Actually, what we were also thinking is to make a sort of a visual demo of the whole process. And which we haven't been able to do so far, but we will we will be will be doing that. And as soon as we are done with that, we'll upload that as well. Well, I'm sure. Uh, see, uh, I don't know about the others, but uh, I don't have sufficient background to understand more than a tiny fraction of what you said. But so any amount of uh, um, additional examples and that sort of thing would be a great yeah. great help. Um, are there any questions immediately? Uh, uh, I had one, if I may. Uh, so, sure. uh, and, and maybe I missed this, but uh, you know, could uh, uh, rules such as dropout be incorporated into this framework as well? Yes, we have already done it. So, I mean, there are some certain certain implementation issues that we have not been able to. I haven't been able to talk about, but yes, yes, it could be. And it's already done. In fact, the particle dimension, there is another important thing that I, I should have talked about. The particle dimension, we employed batch training, right? So the particle dimension is restricted by the multiplication of the uh, you know, batch size times the number of classes for that particular classification problem. Okay. So to answer your question, yes. All right. Thanks. Anybody else? Any other questions? It's a bit theoretically demanding, but I mean, I understand that. And so, I mean, you can just email me if you have additional questions. So, uh, Nanshu, I have a different kind of question about approximations in general, which uh, I have not. I find that uh, people dealing with approximations rarely uh, want, want to do it that way for various reasons. Maybe the uh, underlying theory is harder. Um, but most of the time, when you're looking to approximate something, at least in machine learning, I have found that you don't actually care about the value. You're only caring about the ordering of things. Um, right. So you don't really need to approximate the thing at all. You just need to approximate the order of uh, things. And that too, you don't care if your approximation is very bad for anything other than the top few guys. Um, exactly, exactly. But, 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 but I find that 
nobody really wants to so so you know the all of the optimization stories always about this is the loss function we have to uh, either optimize it we have to approximate it so that we can get the lowest loss actually you just want to get an estimate of the guy who's got the lowest loss you don't really care what his loss is at all in many cases um, in a, in, a, in a way ashwin adas form is doing that but you know what the problem is i mean what you are saying i agree completely okay but you you present that in public domain okay you, you will be taken apart so i mean the uh, kind of me i mean uh, somebody like you could do it present it better than me and wouldn't be taken apart if you look at rank order statistics rather than uh, than actually uh, dealing with so if you have a kind of statistical framework for uh, for your loss function and you're doing yes. your estimates based on that and you say exactly. that you know what is, so you can do a a reasonable job of it but uh, uh i mean you you can uh, you can i agree i mean that is what some people are trying to do i mean resampling right resampling is essentially that right i mean so even even i mean to be honest with you in this particular in this particular framework i mean i don't really require all the particles you know simultaneously converging down to the minimum point i i, I really want a few right and i really don't care about others wherever they are so, yeah, so even in the even in sort of deep networks for example i mean uh, i think uh, i could raise the point about uh, dropout but i i mean i've always wondered whether do you really need the weights of all of these guys to be exactly where they are or is it the case that for most of them they could be in any substantial large interval and not make any difference to the to the final result which is why something like dropout anyway seems to correct i, I mean, mean yes so is it the case that uh, uh, i mean is there stuff that goes on which says that uh, okay rather than estimating the weights i'll just estimate the interval of the weights and then that interval keeps shrinking and expanding as you uh, as you sort of try to do the the loss function mm-hmm. after that when you're actually going to predict you just randomly draw from that interval and then you just yes you know, you i mean i i think i think so because typically then what you are essentially saying is that i mean i have i mean that is exactly what i was you know indicating when i was talking about the you know second order approximation region around a particular point right so you typically have a bunch of weights right and you sort of require a few to be in an optimal position and as long as the other weights are sort of embedded within a particular region okay defined by the topology of the network you are fine yeah so what i'm saying is that rather than say that some particular guys have to be uh exactly some values i'm saying that the whole thing becomes a business of narrowing and <laughs> expanding intervals in which these yes. weights are and uh, all you're doing is basically or even you don't even have to narrow and expand the interval maybe you're just having a probability distribution over the values of those weights and uh, you know some of some of them have some small peak somewhere which you keep updating and uh, after a point you don't really care in the sense that if some of these distributions change it's not going to make any difference to the uh, exactly. to the final exactly. final answer exactly. because uh, the you know the the probability of class 1 is not going to change i mean the pro- the fact that class 1's probability is greater than class 2 is not going to change even if you jiggle a lot of these distributions in a in a substantial way the class 1's probability will still be greater than class 2 so if you plan to unless you plan to use the the probability itself it doesn't really make much of a difference i don't yes, know whether yes. um uh, yes yes actually yeah titraj titraj is saying that bayesian back propagation exactly does that i'm not sure how it works though so he may probably you know tell more about it right but no, i mean so titraj bayesian back prop basically 
builds a probability distribution on weight values. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sort of. Yeah. yeah. Parameter of the Gaussian. Right. Yeah. No, so but my, my my point is this: that uh, at some point, you, you know, you don't really need to know the exact distributions on those uh, on those parameters to any great uh, degree of precision. So the um, you know, you could have them as Gaussians, but uh, does it really matter that the mean of that Gaussian is, uh, you know, 2.1 versus uh, 2.5? Probably not, I think, is my guess. That I have to look at. I mean, I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, neither am I. But neither am I. But generally speaking, Ashwin, I think we agree. I mean, what you were saying is pretty much what is happening in Adesorm as well. I mean, just that we don't know yet because we haven't looked at the probability distribution of the weights. Well, so but I would... I don't know whether you can do it, but I would think the idea of order rather than value, so using order yes. statistics rather than value based Correct. optimization. Correct. In fact, uh, I was not I was not obsessed with the value actually. To be honest with you, I mean it is because of the insistence of one particular referee that we had to do it. We had to show that okay, at x is equal to zero, this is the analytical minima. At x is equal to zero, this is the approximate minima. We had to do that for all the loss all uh, loss functions as well. So, yeah. so, so, because he, he, Ashir, I think you should realize what you were saying is hard to di digest as as well, right? Not to I mean, me. Not to me. I mean, for anybody who's do. done enough machine right. learning, we know that. Right. Uh, I mean, so uh, you know, most of us right. who right. I mean, I spend our lives in uh, actually doing this, we know that there's no point tweaking models beyond a certain point because you know it's not going to make any difference. Yeah. In the end, it's the representation that matters. It's not the model, really. So that's that's my yeah. oh, my position. So, I mean, so, uh, others will have that now. Uh, I can believe will be hard to digest for certain kinds of people. But actually, if you you know any amount of machine learning will tell you that actually once all of the work is in the data, really not in the models. So, okay. Um, so I had a sort of quick comment that that speaks to the broader point of uh, that, that Ashwin is making, uh, and and sort of uh, in in the neuroscience community, there's this whole sort of genre of work that uh, uh, you know is motivated by the question of well, uh, you know, in the brain, for example, how does how does credit assignment happen? You know, uh, as far as we can tell, you know, there is no uh, 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 sign that there is sort of gradient descent going on, which requires you know, significant amount of information flowing in the other direction. So uh, there have been proposals where, uh, uh, you know, uh, just with a uh, with a modest but fairly noisy signal, people have been able to show performance that, uh, you know, by and large, uh, does about as well as uh, as gradient descent. And so, uh, uh, yes, you're right. In fact, there is yeah. this thing called Langevian dynamics, right, which pretty much does that. I mean, what they actually show is that a I mean, uh, stochastic gradient descent can be actually thought of as an ETO process. So right. what you are saying, what you are saying is correct, and that is actually one of the uh, one of the inspiring one of the inspiring sources of of this work. Uh, Snehanshu, uh, yep. uh, Navneet here from Pilani. Yeah, hi Navneet. Yeah, hi. Navneet. Uh, hi. Okay. Uh, I I just uh, I mean uh, it's not a question, but uh, just. Uh, like there is a lot of work uh, uh, that's going on in mathematics uh, on approximation theory, mm -hmm. right? And I know a couple of guys who are deep into it. And so are we drawing anything from that work uh, or? Not much, okay. only, when, only when we are measuring the order of approximation. Okay. So if you are if you are obsessed with what sort of order of approximation you are giving to your exact gradient, or like, I mean, how well are you able to approximate the error gradient if you do it the normal way, which is computing the error gradient, right? Okay. okay. Hmm. Other than that, see the mathematical approximation methods, like for example, you know, the uh, least square finite element methods or the Galatine met based methods, right? So these are local right. mesh methods. So what really happens is when you try to you know use this mm -hmm. in a over a large landscape, these All methods right. become really computationally expensive. So let me tell you that mm -hmm. that example that I was showing that the water wave 
partial differential equation right uh -huh. so about about a decade back i wrote an ls fem method which took me 3 days to run okay that's because of the local mesh thing because it it's mm -hmm. it, it just because all the mathematical approximation methods are obsessed with the order of approximation okay so anything between anything between linear and quadratic i mean anything linear is not acceptable it has to be at least super linear and better if it's quadratic okay right so no free lunch right so mm -hmm. if you are if you are so obsessed with the accuracy of approximation you will actually lose on the speed of convergence correct so uh, yeah, I, yeah i agree with you but what i want to say is that if they are doing uh, something on the values right we can definitely draw something for the order so yeah, yes locally yes locally yes okay so i mean uh, i'll I, I mean i'm not too much aware of that but i know a couple of people so probably i can connect you with them uh, sure no i also right? know people yeah. in fact I, as i said in another life th that is what i was doing i mean like a decade back so okay. i was in i am a numerical approximation used to be a numerical approximation guy <laughs> so i mean All right. i i know i mean so those are mostly finite element galerkin best methods mm -hmm. which are used on also remember these are mostly on the kind of approximations people develop are only on laminar flows okay. like they take a small section they took a profile of the fluid right and they don't really do it like if you think of ocean waves yeah. they do it separately for the deep water waves and separately for the shallow water waves okay. so they don't so combine i have, I have to go to another meeting so i'll you okay, go ahead. yeah okay okay. So, okay thanks yeah okay thank you Okay. Okay. So I think uh, uh, Shneha and Shu, we can discuss it offline. I think uh, we are all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll also upload the video. Ah, the, yeah, sure. You know, to the Google Drive, and then let Shrinivas upload uh -huh. it to the YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah. So all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shneha and Shu, for this nice talk. And we. Shneha yeah. and Shu, it's a good, a good talk. Yeah. We just thank enjoyed. You, Thanks for Thank the talk, you. Dr. Saha. Very nice. Thank you, Dr. Srinivan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.